Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, we're here with Manakshi Nayar Ambujan, who's a doctoral candidate in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology at the Graduate Institute in Switzerland. Um, and she just wrapped up her 13-month-long ethnographic fieldwork in September of last year. Um, and her piece, Navigating in the Field, uh, Doing Fieldwork as a Woman, draws on uh, one of the many instances of gender violence in the field from her experiences of that time. Um, so, Manakshi, thank you for speaking with us today. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit more about what led you to write this piece, um, which at, it kind of feels like almost like excerpts from your fieldwork diary, um, and maybe some experiences you've had in the field beyond that. We'd love to just hear in general about what led you to this piece and also your own experiences. Yeah. Well, firstly, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, really, I mean, it's, it's, it's very kind. Um, as far as the piece itself, I think the moment I wrote it, I think this was a piece from July. Um, it was after several months of fieldwork and there were many instances where, you know, things weren't going as planned. Um, and at one juncture, it just, I just had to vent. And I just wanted to, you know, express the fact that this notion of uh, clean, um, a sort of organized but still messy fieldwork does not exist. And gendered violence is still very much a reality. I think the other aspect that sort of provoked me to write this piece was also the uh, fact that prior to, um, so basically my fieldwork was conducted in India, uh, just to contextualize, and in a southern state, and I don't want to reveal too many details because it's a respect for my interlocutors. Um, so I just, just shifted sites, so I'd moved from one particular site to another. And what alarmed me about this situation was that in my second field site, a lot of these encounters weren't physical. So I would have these remarks that are being constantly um, thrown at me about whether it was, you know, my marital status. Um, sometimes it was a proposition, very, a veiled proposition to spend a night with somebody. And these were all, um, you know, powerful, uh, powerful officials working at this very powerful organization. So obviously as an ethnographic researcher, I didn't want to, you know, um, let's say I didn't want to ruin my field. So, and one knows that there are these inherent power relations that are entrenched right. and you need to be careful. Um, but that being said, I guess my issue is also that in my previous field site, um, I did have a very, uh, I mean, I was physically assaulted and there it was easier for me to name it because I knew what it was. Here, what bothered me was the fact that I couldn't articulate it. Um, and I did not know if I could call it harassment or not. Um, I wasn't sure if this was something that was part of ethnography because as an ethnographer or a field worker, you consistently do things that you otherwise don't do. Mm -hmm. And me as a private person versus me as an ethnographer were consistently in battle. So it was almost as if it was a conundrum that I couldn't figure. Um, and it, it, I think that month in July, I almost had enough because I was getting all of these phone calls and I didn't know how to address them. At the same time, I wanted to maintain good relationship with my interlocutors. Much of my field work was still left. I had four or six months left. Um, and I also had this notion of you know, doing good field work and I didn't want to quit. Mm -hmm. So I think that some of these tropes that especially anthropology tends to you know, push into uh, doctoral seminars, etc., make you consistently place yourself as an individual. Uh, I mean, I think it doesn't really look at researchers and fledging PhD students as individuals, uh, but more as people who are out there who are just doing their job and are supposed to come back unscathed. And it doesn't necessarily talk about the gender dimensions of fieldwork, even though we consistently question positionality and ethics and all of that. Right. Um, so yeah yeah absolutely um this this inability to name is is a really important kind of a thing and that lingering feeling of knowing that this is uncomfortable and you really don't like that this is going on um but it's kind of hard to um quite categorize it and also that these individuals tend to be gatekeepers of the communities that we really rely on and our work relies on and that huge fear of retaliation if we somehow upset them if they don't like how we respond if, we, if there's sort of a negation of those advances, what that might mean as far as access to those communities and um, like larger implications to their power in the community and what they could even, um, you know, how they could um, 
impacts. Um, and so um, were you, did you have any guidance or did you reach out for, um, you know, any kind of guidance at, at the level of mentorship? Um, or um, did you have similar researchers that shared this experience in that area? So before we head out for fieldwork, at least in my institute, we are supposed to fill out this fieldwork risk evaluation form. Mm -hmm. And if you look at mine, because I did, you know, look at mine before coming in today to just look at how prepared I, so, I was. Mm -hmm. And I had these detailed plans as to what I would do, uh, you know, if at all something untoward would happen. And I realized that none of those plans materialized. Like I did have a support system in place. Um, and surprisingly, I did not reach out to my supervisor. Um, I felt ashamed, to be honest, to be reaching out to her, saying that, listen, I'm having trouble doing field work. Um, and apart from the power relations aspect, I was also mindful of privilege. Mm -hmm. um, like at least in my context, of course, the organization I was interacting with was privileged and placed me in a place of um, less power. But most of the people who came to this organization and where this organization was located, they were all marginal spaces. So one of the things that I was very careful about, and I still am careful about, is how I represent these spaces, especially because there's so much stereotyping that is involved with the community and the geographical location as well. So I knew that had it not been the case that I was researching, I wouldn't have been mindful about so many things. But now I'm essentially very careful about how to even write about this to my supervisor so that I do not mobilize a certain trope, a certain stereotypical trope that would disadvantage communities that are otherwise very vulnerable and marginal. Right. Um, but eventually when I did come back to university, because so much had gone on uh, from the physical assault to the non-physical assault here. Um, and when I came back, I again didn't want to talk to her about it, but I broke down and my supervisor was taken aback and she's been exceptionally supportive. Uh, and I was lucky that way. I still am lucky that way. But what caught my attention was how this was also very prevalent among my cohort. So we are 11 uh, people who identify themselves as women and one person who identifies uh, themselves as man. And uh, of course, for the guy, the experiences were different and he had one of the smoother field works. But for the others, um, some of them did feel or at least have experienced some sort of difficulties. Um, it may not have been sexualized harassment or it may not have been an assault of, or any of those, but they did have, they did experience some form of gendered uh, difficulties in the spaces in which they conducted field work. And what was also remarkable was how my supervisor, when she was trying to tell me, and she said that, you know, she wouldn't completely, she may not be able to place herself in my shoes and understand what happened, even though she's very sorry about what happened. She said that there was an instance when she was doing field work where something, uh, where she was, she consistently had to, had to sort of portray this image of a married woman to be safe. And how at that point in time, she never took, it to, took that action to be something where she was playing, you know, these gender stereotypical roles. But now, you know, thinking back and looking back at it, um, it, seemed, it seemed to her that we consistently, you know, are engaging with a very gendered form of doing field work and ethnography, which doesn't necessarily make it to the books we write or the theses we write. Um, because after all of this, was, I mean, especially when all of this was going on, I started looking for online resources. So I came across Amy Pollard's work, uh, Sinatra's work, especially Amy Pollard, because I thought those two works were really, really helpful for me. And that's when I decided that I needed to write it down because the other thing that I kept in mind was that nobody's going to believe me if I said this 20 years down the line that something untoward happened. And given that much of my research also looks into documentation practices, um, I just wanted to make sure that it's documented so that if somebody else were to look up on something like this, they know that they're not alone and things like this happen. And my supervisor has been super supportive because I did let her know that in my thesis, at least I want one section, especially in the methodology portion where people know that, you know, field work isn't that clean and the messiness is not the Melanoskian you know, issue where he can't talk to people or, you know, he had difficulty connecting. I mean, that is, those are of course issues, but gender-based violence is a reality. Uh, it's about how 
you consistently have to navigate your position. Like in this particular organization, for instance, people didn't think twice before um, saying some of the weirdest things that they have, whether it was about propositioning me to their home uh, to spend a night or uh, whether it was asking for a sexual favor or whether it was asking for money or whether it was just consistently barraging me with these phone calls. Yeah. Um, you wrote about that almost like being stalked even. You were kind of being constantly um, yeah. har harassed by phone. Um, by phone and to an extent that there was this one day when, so there's this small tea shop right next to this organization. And every day it was by habit, I am a tea drinker. So I'd stop by, have a cup of tea and then go to this organization. And that was also one of the ways in which I built relationships with the communities that came there. And there was this one day when this man, uh, the, the officer who had called me incessantly saw me and I avoided going to the tea shop that day because I was like, if he sees me there, then he's gonna just say something weird. And he came out to the road and he yelled and called me out and then uh, called me by, by my name and he was like, come and let's just have tea. And I said, no, I don't want to, I have to go, uh, there's work. And then he was like, no, 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 you need to come and have tea with me. It's important. And he started creating this entire scene. And this was right in the middle of the road. Um, and it started making me feel very uncomfortable. And then he turns to this man who usually prepares the tea and asks him, does she come here or not? So this man who is making tea, obviously he was well-intentioned and he said, she comes here all the time. So then I was put in a very weird spot where there was one person who confirmed that I always go there. And now I was saying, no, I didn't want to go there. And he ended up making me go there, sit with him, have tea. And he paid for my tea, even though I asked him not to. And then basically said that this, I, I'm paying for your tea so that next time you will invite me here and we'll have tea together. Um, and in any other context, it may not seem that absurd, but here it was just that there were calls. He would drunk dial me, he would drunk call me. Um, and then, you know, it just got a little too much. And he wouldn't do it when there was a male present. So I did also have a research assistant who was male simply to navigate the gender dimension of my field. And whenever the male research assistant would just stand by me, um, he wouldn't come next to me. As soon as this man left, uh, the officer would come and start, you know, just making me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes he would just accompany me to rooms where he shouldn't uh, just come. Right, yeah. Well, you've said so many um, insightful things, and I think um, kind of touching on that underlying issue that, um, firstly, I mean, you both, you and I are anthropologists. I know at Field Recognition, we have all kinds of researchers, but since we are anthropologists, this awareness that we don't want to lend ourselves to, um, we don't want our experience to lend itself to beliefs or stereotypes about an area and how that even kind of might motivate us to not speak about it because we worry that we're going to make live these ideas about you know the, these tropes as you said um but also just in that experience you shared how it's almost on both sides uh, our inability to say no or our inability to put down firm boundaries on the side of the community where we work because you know um we the, the reliance of their acceptance the reliance of their stories and our and uh, you know our own safety right we don't want to um kind of poison this this well that we have to drink of if we're living there and this is where we're doing our work but at the same time this inability to also lay down um, boundaries and say look this is what's happening or say no to our own institutions because we don't want to feel like we don't know what we're doing we want to put our best foot forward we want them to believe you know uh, everything is going great and so um this kind of space where we we aren't really able to move and that uncomfort that grows with it and also the, that fear of real safety I imagine since you've shared that you have experienced, uh, you know, a very physical uh, assault that this is in, you know, in your mind and that this is, of course, um, you know, something that, you know, that, that need to be safe and, and, but still to carry on with our work is, is, is present. Um, and so um, do you, you know, what do you, what is your um, thoughts about in general, how um, we can, um, how researchers can sort of, um, exert more of their agency at the same time, given that what we know, these are the constructs that, um, you know, uh, field work is in a sense, but how, what kind of support can be offered or what kind of ways in which, um, you know, field workers can set firm boundaries and not have to be, you know, enduring uncomfortable situations. Because what I think we both know is that once you say yes, and once you kind of allow that boundary to be breached, there's really, you hope that it stops there, but it doesn't, it keeps going, right? And you, you mentioned that even still you get calls and you're still kind of harassed. 
Um, and so what are your thoughts in general about how, um, what steps can be taken? I know this is a big question, but, but what you felt like maybe you could have benefited from in that moment or what you needed really? I think um, on the top of my head, the one thing that I really wish I knew then was that the notion of good field work and doing good field work is so, you know, the prototype is this white American male. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think we need to do a lot of unlearning as to what doing good field work means. And eventually when I did come out to my supervisor, she said something that was very poignant that, you know, it's always you who comes first. Everything else is secondary. I think had I reached out to her sooner, she must, she might, might have told me to just leave everything and come back. Mm -hmm. um, but to also recognize that, that is really an option because the way in which we think about these PhD programs is almost as if we need to slog and, you know, it's our sweat and blood and you can't quit. Um, and there is a lot involved because you're really closely involved with your project and you don't think that you can pause and come back because it's almost as if it's a mark of failure. Um, and I think that it's something I wish I knew that, you know, it's okay to pause and that is also fine because fieldwork isn't perfect. And the other thing, of course, is just preparedness. Um, I don't know how uh, graduate schools deal with this in the States, but uh, at my institute, for instance, we have uh, methodology training in methodology and of course training in theory. But the one thing that we don't talk about, even in our courses about doing fieldwork, is how gendered fieldwork is. There's an absolute silence about the fact that you can and will get harassed or you can and will put yourselves in situations that you otherwise would never put yourself and you know we normalize it um in fact there was this one time when i did tell a professor that perhaps it's important to open up this conversation in our department uh, eventually now they are but the first reaction to it wasn't very positive um it was about how it's a private matter and how people won't be comfortable talking about it um, of course, there would be people who are not comfortable talking about what they endured and it's, it's every, everybody has ownership of, over their stories and it's up to them whether they want to share it or not. But a remarkable number of people feel they're alone and that, you know, this doesn't happen. And the fact that anthropology is a discipline that prizes itself in field work and talks about everything under the sun, except for the fact that it could be potentially unsafe, is a problem. And academic spaces don't engage in this dialogue. Um, and it's only when we engage in this dialogue that we can perhaps think about strategies. You know, is there a way in which you can reach out to another researcher who's nearby who could perhaps offer you insights? Or are there potential spaces that you can avoid? Is there a way to reframe your research question once you're in a position if, you know, if you're not comfortable? Or there are ways in which one can think about it. But I think for that, we need to first and foremost acknowledge the fact that this is a reality and it's not something um, that academia is bereft of in terms of you know sexualized violence um, and also literally just unlearning what it means to do field work um, because sometimes we have this notion of long extended field works being done and surprisingly after the pandemic now anthropologists are more willing to reconceive field work and so there's a willingness now despite the fact that I think it was years ago when um, it was either Margaret Mead's student, I'm not sure whose student it was, Henrietta, uh, somebody Henrietta who is- Henrietta Schmuller in 1931, yeah. Exactly, so it's, it's as early as that that uh, a person was raped and murdered. And we then, you know, held on to this notion of no, fieldwork needs to mean something and has to mean something. And now with the pandemic, people are thinking about patchwork, ethnography and other forms. So. You know, the fact that a pandemic can make people, of course, the pandemic is important, and, you know, it's, it's in, with its own seat, but willingness to work right now is there. How so many years people in various forms and ways have been talking about how women don't feel comfortable doing field work in certain ways, or at least there have been articles. It's not like, you know, there have been no articles. I mean, Amy Pollard's work came out in 2008, 2009. And yet the inclination to do something about it um, has been largely missing. And I think that debate needs to be normalized in departments where you have young students going into these spaces doing field work. 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just drawing off of Dr. Sina Klaas's work on good and bad fieldwork and this large unwillingness to, you know, we were often told even at Fieldwork Initiative, if we want to have these conversations, what we're doing is dissuading women from doing fieldwork, which is a bad thing, which is a bit silly, isn't it? Um, considering that, um, you know, what's what we know that it's, you know, a, a problem of rampant gendered violence. Um, and so this is a wonderful kind of um, thing that you've brought now into the conversation, this idea of how it's now willing to change with COVID, but all of the stories that we know have ha kind of happened and been hidden before um, just seem to kind of go right under the rug. Or works were kind of marginalized and pushed to the peripheries of science and they were kind of featured in blogs or feminist journals, but they didn't really hit the core nucleus of, you know, academy or anthropology especially. Um, I'm curious, as my last question, have you received people, because you spoke about how important it is to write, you know, these pieces, which it is, and how people felt they were alone. Did you receive any um, replies from people who had similar experiences or what was the the um, experience of publishing this and, and how you um, you know how you felt afterwards or what conversations were had afterwards so after publishing the piece a few people reached out saying that they'd experienced um, a similar situation or they found themselves in similar situations um, but I was what amazed me was how some of my friends reacted in terms of how I was doing the wrong thing by staying in so the onus was once again on me, uh, you know, because I could have left, but I didn't leave. So I thought that was interesting. But a couple of uh, my colleagues and I at the Institute, we decided to um, host, uh, like have a seminar on gender and sexualized violence. And that received quite a bit of, uh, I mean, we did have people participating and that was one of those closed spaces where many people came around to saying that, you know, it was an important discussion. So I think, um, even though it was not based off the piece itself, but this made me, I mean, this was a conversation that I wouldn't have imagined, let's say three years ago. So it's it, even, you know, I guess academia had also shielded me from that. Like I, I mean, of course I knew that Genevieve's violence is a reality, but you know, you don't think it would happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and then what one, to me, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think the distance is where, you know, your privilege shields you from so much, uh, quite a bit in academia. And after this, when I started talking to people, because I was like, I just needed to do something. I felt that it was unfair that you're sending students without doing much. And that's when we did come together and have a workshop. Um, and that was well received. And there we realized once again as to how, you know, conversations like this are very, very important. Um, yeah, so that is one of the tiny positives that did uh, come through, yeah. Excellent. Well, I guess that's a good place for us to lay it down. Um, um, and actually, thank you so much for being here with us and speaking on this really important topic. Um, both your piece, your, your, um, you know, your writing and your words today have been really insightful and we really just appreciate the opportunity, as well as your openness and your willingness to speak on it. So thank you very much. Um, and in signing off, you, you can read Manakshi's piece and there will be a link posted for any viewers that are interested. And please um, join us again for our next installment of Field Stories. Um, it, it, the series where we're, you know, t wanting to talk one-on-one -on -one with researchers to explore um, inequities in scientific fieldwork. So thank you so much again, Manakshi. Thank you so much, Erica. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you.